If you thought that the first part of that lesson sounded familiar, that's because you heard it last week. And last week's sermon was, so what, S-O-W, what are we sowing if we're going to sow like God, or if we're going to sow like Jesus. Today is the so what, the S-O what. Because that's what you have to ask yourself when you read scripture, so what? The question, what does this mean? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to others? What does it mean about God? What does it mean about my relationship with God? What does it mean about my relationship with other people? If you learn to ask the so what question, you'll find you read with greater, greater intensity and with greater feeling. Let me ask you, how many of you like a good joke? How many of you ever heard a joke and went, huh, what, what? Did you laugh at the time like, ah, ha, ha, because everybody else is laughing and you didn't want to look like you didn't understand it? Or perhaps you've heard a joke and then you didn't know what it meant in the middle of the night you wake up and say, I get it now. Then you laugh or cry or whatever. Now, I can't think of his name, and I looked it up this morning, and I forgot it already because I am not as young as I used to be. But anyway, one of the theologians who was part of putting together the Disciple Bible Study, which I know some of you took in the past, said, a good parable is like a good joke. You either get it or you don't, right? We tend to think of parables, these stories that Jesus told to illustrate what his point is, as being very easy to understand and very simple, but they're not. They're complicated. Sometimes they don't make sense. This one doesn't make sense unless you're growing zucchini. Because how many of you can plant one seed and have a hundred whatever you planted grow? Unless, of course, it's a zucchini, then you'll have 9,000 of them. But Jesus says things in parables, and then the disciples were standing there like the guys listening to the joke, going, oh, 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 we get it. Then later they go to him and say, Lord, we have no idea what in the world you're talking about. And in this passage, they don't even have to ask him. They just say, why are you teaching them in parables? And he says things that really seem very hard to hear, don't they? I'm teaching so those who have hearts to hear will hear and the others won't understand. And then he quotes Isaiah. Now, this is the call of Isaiah, you know, the burning tongues, the coal that touched his lips and cleansed him so he could speak. But what a call to have from God saying, I want you to go to preach to people. They're not going to understand a thing you say. They're going to be hard-hearted. They're going to be stubborn. They're not going to listen to a thing you say. I would say, sign me up for more of that, Jesus. And in fact, I have been appointed to that congregation from time to time. Not this one, just others that shall remain unnamed. But here we are listening to this story, and Jesus goes on to explain to them what it means. If we didn't think we were in trouble before, we're in trouble now, aren't we? Because he's saying, the word is the seed, the word of the kingdom of heaven, the word of God, the word made flesh in Jesus Christ, the word entrusted to us to share. It's going to fall on different ears and in different hearts like the seed falls on different types of soil. There's the soil that is really hardened from the sun. It's baked in the sun. And what's the seed going to do there? It's going to bounce off, right? Birds are going to come and snatch it away. Then there's the seed that falls on the uh, soil that is rocky. And it's going to take root, but there's not going to be a depth enough to carry it through, and it's going to wither, and it's going to die in the sun. Then there's the one that's choked by weeds, and it's not going to survive. Then there's the one that falls on the fertile soil and it's going to grow, it's going to grow, it's going to grow, and you're going to get a thousand zucchini from one seed in terms of the way the kingdom is going to spread. Spread like people trying to give zucchini away at the end of summer, right? How many of you have ever tried to give away more zucchini than anybody? I mean, I had a church once where people had baskets of zucchini sitting there saying, I will pay you to take this home and bake some bread. So what is Jesus saying when he says, Well, that that hard soil is the one where the devil, the evil one, temptation, all those things that take us from God and lure us away, are going to come and snatch it away. And then what does he say about the rocky soil? That's the people whose faith is just very shallow, hasn't had time to develop, and it's going to just wither. As soon as trouble comes, it's going to fall apart. Then there's the weeds. That's the worries and cares of the world and money and stuff like that, he says, that comes and snatches it away so that it chokes out. Now, sometimes I said last week, and I'll say it again, you'll hear sermons saying, what kind of dirt are you? What kind of dirt are you? I don't want you to think that way. Because I think you're all here because at some point you receive the word of God. No matter what tried to snatch it or steal it from you, no matter what tried to choke it out, no matter what tried to burn it off, you're here because it's taken root in you. Does that mean we're supposed to look at other people and say, my dirt's better than your dirt? No. 
We are called to be tenders of the soil as well as tenders of the garden. Last week I said we're supposed to sow as recklessly as God does, just scatter that seed everywhere and let it bloom and let it take root where it will, not counting the possibilities ahead of us, not, not evaluating, but don't we tend to judge the soil that we sow the word of God into? What are the things that make people hard? Could be their experiences, could be the rejection they faced before, it could be their life circumstances, it could be being told that they were worthless or useless or no good, not right for church or God or service. It could be that they're grieving and they feel like their hearts are so dried out that nothing can penetrate anymore. Same thing with the people with faith that hasn't had time to really develop. This is where pastors sin against congregations repeatedly. You get somebody who's new to faith and they're on fire for Jesus and you're going to make sure you use up every ounce of fuel they have in them. They're going to volunteer for every committee. They're going to volunteer to bake every cookie. They're going to volunteer to serve every meal and clean up and stack chairs and they're going to sign up for the media team and they're going to sign up for this and that and pastors are like, what else can you do? Ha, 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 well, I have you. And then trouble comes and they're going to fall away because they're going to burn out because the depth of soil isn't there. Or sometimes people will pray and they'll say, God didn't give me what I wanted and I'm done with God. I can't tell you the times through the years it's broken my heart when people say, I prayed for so-and-so to get better, and if he does, I will believe. If he does not, I will never set foot in a church again. And we tend to judge them, don't we? Then there are the people who are choked out by the stuff that happens. And stuff happens. Have you ever heard that expression, stuff happens in your life? What can choke out your faith? Worry? Worry? Money can get in the way. It can get in the way. Or getting ahead. If you are working a 1,000 hours a week and you can't have time for church or your family or anything else, a lot of things are going to suffer in your life. A lot of things are going to be taken over, just like gardens. That's one of the reasons I gave up gardening. I hate to weed. And it just seems, isn't it, that the weeds grow just so much faster than the plants. Threaten to choke them out totally. Lots of things. Competing with others thinking ourselves better than others. Those are the things that can choke the word of God right out of us. But then there's that soil that was carefully tended, that soil that was receptive, that soil that somebody took the trouble to work up and keep watered and make sure there's adequate sunshine. There's the soil that is tended by others. So what if we were to sow recklessly and tend the soil? Maybe we'd see a different kind of harvest. There were was the year that the cabins opened at West River. So this is probably close to 30 years ago, if not at least 30 years ago now. I went to camp, the first year of what we had then that we called deaf camp. Started with four deaf kids mixed up with a bunch of hearing kids. And I had four deaf kids that I was watching out for and a whole cabin full of hearing kids from all over the conference. There was a boy there named Darius. I will never forget Darius. He is the kid that made me about lose my faith in life and Jesus and every, I was ready to go to welding school. Darius worked every nerve I had, and the last one, he lit a fuse, and I was ready to blow. The cabins were brand new. He went out and got himself a big stick and poked holes in every screen in the cabin, all eight of the rooms, so that at night, and it's hot at camp, and they don't have air conditioning, or at least they didn't back in that day, you couldn't open the window because the mosquitoes at West River were coming in like cicadas this July. They were just thick and so we were hot and every time I turned around he was stealing something or cussing or doing something horrible and I went to Andy Thornton who is one of the best human beings I will ever know. His retirement was really a blow to the annual conference because he's, just, he's the kind of person you want in a job forever. I went to Andy and I said this kid has got to go home. I'm tired of him. I'm sick of this. The way he treats people, he's horrible. He doesn't care about Bible stories. He doesn't care about Jesus. Send him home. And he looked at me and said, okay, if we send him home, what does that say to him about Jesus? And I said, well, I'd have to think about that. And he said, no, you, what does it tell him about Jesus? And I said that he's not good enough to be here. Jesus wouldn't want him here. And he said, nope, that's what it's going to tell him, all right, that he is not able to be here because of his behavior. Said a lot about what I thought of him too, didn't it? That I was ready to get rid of him. 
I tried to argue back a little bit. I said, but all the other kids are having such a hard time because of him. And he said, they'll get by. But what is it going to say to him about Jesus if you throw him out? Fast forward 15, 20 years, and I'm at annual conference. And this huge man comes up and grabs me and hugs me. And said, I had no idea who he was. I was looking up at him saying, I'm sorry, I don't recognize you. And he said, it's Darius, Terry. He's the only Darius I've ever known in my life. And I was saying, Darius, what are, you, what are you doing at an annual conference? He says, I'm a lay member from my church. Then he said, I'm thinking about ordained ministry as a career. And I wanted to thank you for how kind you were to me when I was at camp as a kid. I was not kind to him. Kindness meant I didn't throw him out. That was his kindness. I fussed at that kid. I followed him around. I fussed at him. I hollered at him. I begged him. I pleaded with him. I'd never been so glad to say goodbye to a kid in my whole life. And he came up and he thanked me for my kindness. Talk about soil that didn't seem like it was going to take a seed. But it's not up to me, is it? It's not up to me to decide where to sow the seeds of grace and mercy and peace and wholeness and love. It's not up to me whether I share the kingdom of God because I don't think you're ready to hear it. I am called to be a sower of grace. And the so what here is so what. Maybe he's not going to hear it. Isaiah got that horrible call. Isaiah, who's going to go for me? Isaiah says, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And God says, I can fix that. Takes that tongue with that hot, cold, touches his lips, cleanses him, and says, okay, I'm sending you now. Who's going to go for me? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. And then God says, I'm going to send you to people who aren't going to listen to a thing you have to say. But I want you to say it anyway. Mother Teresa, one of her most famous writings is called, Do It Anyway. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Amen. Do good anyway. Give the best you have and it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. The seed you sow may fall on rock, may fall where weeds choke out, may fall on soil where it cannot grow. Sow it anyway. Tell somebody about the love of God in Jesus Christ because God is the word that we sow. God's love in Jesus Christ is the seed that we sow. So sow freely and recklessly in the name of your Savior and trust that God will make a way. And go around tending some soil. If someone is so hard because they've been hurt and they've been told that they can't be forgiven, tell them how you were forgiven, your sins. Tell them how God has come to you in Christ and made you whole and new and help to soften their hearts a little bit by loving them. This is one of my rules of life. The people who are the hardest to love are the ones who need to be loved the hardest. You agree with that one? The people who are the hardest to love are so often the people who need to be loved the hardest. If you meet someone whose faith is shallow, give them some of yours. Let them see what you have. Let them know where you've been. Walk with them. Parable, like paraclete, that word that meant Holy Spirit, meant one who comes alongside. A parable is something you put beside another thing to show the differences. That's why Jesus used parables to teach. Come alongside someone like the Holy Spirit has come alongside you. Be the example of what life could be like for someone else. Show them that they don't have to do it all and they don't have to do it alone. And it's okay. I have said to people who've come to me to volunteer for something, I said, no, you're taking on way too much. I don't want to see you burn out. Instead of, oh, thank you, Lord, for sending me another sucker. That's what we don't want to do. We want to nurture faith. We don't want to stomp it out in its infancy. And if worry is choking someone, sit with them and share their pain. Walk with them in their need, and they will have a different experience of life. Or one of the things that I love most about Epworth is that you all have a heart for mission. 
you bring food in in the midst of a pandemic. You would come here and make sure no one was here and you'd drop off food. You've given money, you've given resources, you've given yourself to teach. You've given so much, continue to give because that's what weeds somebody else's garden. You have to be a soil tender and a seed sower. You have to be the one who shares what God has done for you. Elaine is gonna sing a song in just a few moments that I asked her to sing. It's called, We Are Seeds in God's Hands. And we are, we're the seed and we're the word of God that gets sown around. And you don't know what's gonna happen. But I can tell you this, if you sow no seed, nothing will ever grow. You'll be watering an artificial plant forever. Might look nice, but it's not gonna do anybody any good. There's a hymn that I almost sang this morning, except I'm throwing enough new ones at you. It's called, You Are the Seed That Will Sow a New Sprout. It's a great hymn, but it's hard to sing and it's unfamiliar. And so I opted for an old Methodist one, All Good Gifts. Any of you remember that one? From the 1964 hymnal? Now, when I was in, I guess, middle school is what they call it now. I was in junior high, Cockeysville Junior High, as a matter of fact. There was a show on Broadway called Godspell. Anybody remember Godspell? And this song was in it with a different tune. We plow the fields and scatter the good seed on the land, but it is fed and watered by God's almighty hand. That musical, with Jesus dressed as Superman in clown makeup, spoke to my heart in a way that a lot of sermons never did. We asked to sing that song in church. You know, we were told we we're not going to have any of that hippie music in this church. Hippie music? That was written in the 18th century, those words. The tune was new, but the words were the same. Go into the world sowing. People may not listen to you, sow anyway. People may tell you to get lost, sow anyway. People may turn their back on you and tell you you're a fool for what you believe, sow anyway because that's what is going to plant the seeds of God's hope in a hopeless, drought-filled world. So I hope you'll be like these little kids who have a pot with some dirt and a seed, and their intention is to water it and to work the soil and to make it grow. We all have to do that figuratively, metaphorically, if not directly into the world, so that others might know what we have in abundance and give thanks to God. You could be the seed that grows a field full of zucchini for the Lord. And zucchini's a good thing. Make some good bread. Amen? Amen.